So I had a slightly enigmatic, mysterious title, not just there to sit and look pretty, and a few people wondering what that referred to. Is it Phil Murray I'm talking about, or who or what? Um, it all will be revealed. Um, just a few acknowledgements to start with. Uh, the, the grant uh, was from the Fight for, Fight for Sight and the Birdshot UVITA Society supporting this work to me and Miles Stanford and Chris Hammond, and then it's very much a team effort, so lots of other people involved um, and, uh, and other organizations as well. Um, it's a study at St. Thomas's with King's College London, but some of my research time is funded by the BRC at Moorfields, and Karen Bonstein, who's somewhere here, sorted that out, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and no commercial relationships. That's important because I'll be talking about a company's device, um, but I don't get any cut from the company, and I'm very skeptical about some of their other claims, but I think for this, it's very promising. Uh, so this is what we, every child knows. This is how we see stuff goes on in the world. Light goes into the eye, it goes to the brain. We can break down the eye a little bit. The front of the eye focuses light, and the retina generates electrical signals that are then transmitted to the brain. And we know that birdshot affects the retina, also the choroid, the blood supply to the retina, maybe the vitreous, the bit in front of the retina. Um, and we're getting very good at imaging the retina and uh, in, with greater and greater resolution, lots of pretty pictures. And Pierce Keen, a friend of mine, will talk later on, uh, on, on the high resolution advanced imaging we now have where we can visualize really um, fine detail in the retina. Um, but the retina isn't just there to sit and look pretty, it's there to generate electrical signals. So all of this doesn't tell you much about whether the retina's working or not. Sometimes if it looks a bit odd, then it may not be working well. If it looks good, it may be working well, but that doesn't always go together. So it's quite important to have some functional tests to see if the retina is doing its job, which is to generate electrical signals. Um, we do have some functional tests. We test visual acuity, contrast, visual fields. These are things where we basically ask the brain over there what do you see? But to directly record from the retina gives us that extra parameter or that extra assessment of, of how the retina is working. So uh, that's what I was talking about. It generates electrical signals in response to light, and these can be recorded as the electroretinogram. Uh, and many of you will have had ERGs recorded to, to monitor your bird shot. And there are lots of different parameters one can take from the responses, but the response to 30 hertz flicker light, light that's flickering 30 times a second, seems to be quite a sensitive parameter of the retina not working properly. Uh, quite a good objective parameter, and there are a few papers, including this one, that, that showed that. Problem with it, it's quite cumbersome equipment, so um, this doesn't look that different from uh, the, the Star Trek slide, but this is my research equipment in Cambridge, which belonged to Trevor Lamb, who, who built it. Um, this is a slightly sleeker version, but it's still quite big equipment, often in a different hospital, requiring a separate visit for, for, for the patient, and it takes a long time. So the challenges are waiting time for a test. If, if you happen to be in a hospital that has electrodiagnostics, you may not have to wait long. If you've seen in another hospital, you may have to wait several months. So it can't really be used to guide your immediate treatment. Uh, the testing time it takes an hour. Uh, you may have to go to a different location in the hospital or another hospital. It's not that comfortable. Uh, I've had it done myself and many of you as well. Um, and often it requires pupil dilation. And if that's another visit, that's another few hours where you can't see properly and you've had bright lights uh, in your eyes. So could we have something else that could give us a, I think I've got it here, so I've lost it. Um, that could give us a quick assessment in clinic. And I don't think it would ever replace the gold standard, but it'd be a lot more readily available, especially to just deliver that 30 hertz stimulus and record the retina's response to it. That's what we're looking at at the moment. Um, so I have a, so this is a lot smaller than what you may have seen when you've come for your electrodiagnostic appointments. And I need a beautiful assistant, so Will's gonna come here in the absence of a beautiful assistant. Um, <laughs> so Will Tucker is a good friend of mine and who trained with me at St. Thomas's and is now with me at Moorfields and can't seem to get rid of him. Um, but he's now, uh, so we're just gonna do a dummy, dummy run to show you what it's like. So um, no need for pupil dilation, pupils aren't dilated. Um, we'll just do one eye for the sake of time. It's a skin surface electrode, so instead of those cumbersome electrodes, this is just something that goes on the skin. And I was going to do a live demonstration where we really deliver the flashes, but it forces you to enter lots of patient details. So within the time, we're not going to have time for that, but I'll just show you how it works. You enter the patient details, it takes a minute, you can do that before the patient comes in. And then it just clips on here, and 
if you cover your left eye, and literally it's held over the eye, and it takes about it, it takes about 30 seconds for each stimulus, and you might run it a few times, so it takes a few minutes. So immediately you can get that, and it's it's quite. Um, thank you very much, Will. You can sit down. Um, so it's very quick. It really is that quick. The, the, the majority of the time is actually entering the patient details into the machine. And, and there are some problems at the moment. You can't call up a previous patient, so you have to enter it in every time, which is why I didn't do it now, because it would have taken extra minutes. Um, but you can use it undilated. There have been handheld ERG devices for decades used in research. But this is actually better than, than previous ones because it's got an infrared camera so you can see whether the subject's got their eye open or not. It's got a pupillometer to calculate the pupil area so you don't need to dilate. It decides what intensity it needs to use and it uses skin surface electrodes. The company actually originally developed it for diabetic retinopathy, which I'm not so sure about, but I think for delivering a standard stimulus in birdshot patients, it could be very useful. So these, this is an example of the recording. So if I'd done it really on Will, within a minute, I'd have a printout like that. Um, that's some responses from a healthy subject's left eye. And you can see that there's an orange trace and a green trace. And it shows it's quite reproducible. People wonder about how reproducible ERGs are. This is within the same session, but it's very reproducible. And you get a little parameter, milliseconds there. So 25.7 milliseconds is the this parameter, this implicit time, this thing that tells you about retinal function, and that's normal. Uh, there we have a birdshot patient. You can see it's a lot smaller, and, and that's important, but actually what's more sensitive is the delay in that time. So in that millisecond column, MS, you see 38.1, so that's significantly delayed. So a test within a few minutes could give you an idea of how your retina's functioning and could be used to guide treatment, to assess novel treatments, could feed data into the biobank, that you could have it on, on every patient in every clinic in the country. Uh, it, it should be doable. But it, it needs some validation. We don't know if what it's giving us is really as good as what traditional ERG equipment gives us. So our study that we've been funded for and that we're grateful for is, uh, is to compare the retival with standard ERG recording and some various other parameters of disease activity. And we're looking at birdshot patients at St. Thomas's. Different machines are different, so you need normative data for this machine, so I think that's a big limiting factor, but we've got a big cohort of twins based at St. Thomas's Hospital, they're based all over the country, but they come to St. Thomas's Hospital, around 12,000 of them volunteer for lots of research studies, and um, we, we've recorded so far on 320 of them to get a normative uh, 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 database to, to know what normal is for this machine, because that's quite important. Um, and, and these are just some preliminary results, which I literally analyzed last night. The, um, the time with this device is plotted there, and the uh, conventional time you get for that parameter is plotted there. And whenever you see something as good as that, sort of a correlation like that, means that they're very correlated. If, if you read long or delayed with one machine, you'll read delayed with the other machine. So it's actually quite good. And the correlation coefficient is very close to one, which gives you an idea of how good the agreement is. Lots of other analysis has to be done, and, and we're doing that, but the preliminary results are very good. Um, I was talking to the legend that is Chris Hogg, who's somewhere around here, and you'll see his poster outside is a little bit different, but there are reasons for that. It's using a different stimulus, a different way of doing it, but I think for this, it, it, it is very promising. Um, using our normal database, we could decide whether flicker times are normal or abnormal based on our recordings from healthy subjects before, hundreds of them, and you can see that with one machine, if you're to the right of the the red line, you're abnormal, and the other machine, if you're above the red line, and they pretty much agree. If you're normal on one, you're probably normal on the other, and if you're abnormal on one, you're abnormal on the other, apart from one or two patients who are sort of borderline, which is what you'd expect. So, uh, so we've got the potential to, to have an objective parameter of retinal function assessed in every patient, in every clinic within minutes. Our preliminary results are, are very promising, um, but there's a lot more work to be done. We're continuing this study and we'll be collaborating with colleagues at Moorfields as well uh, in the near future. Thanks very much.